Astronauts living on the moon will need lots of power, but they can't take fuel supplies with them. A new generation of miniature nuclear reactors could be the answer. The 1970s TV series Space 1999 began like many a sci-fi drama with a bang. A nuclear explosion tears the moon out of Earth's orbit and sends Moonbase Alpha and its inhabitants on an exciting adventure through deep space. It obviously left an impression on a young Elon Musk. In 2017, when envisioning SpaceX's plans for a future moon base, he named it Alpha. Today, SpaceX is working with NASA to return humankind to the moon's surface as part of the U.S. Space Agency's Artemis program. The planned lunar outpost, however, has a more pragmatic working title, Artemis Base Camp. NASA and the U.S. Department of State have issued combined guidelines for peaceful lunar exploration in the form of the Artemis Accords. So far, 36 nations, including India, Japan, the UK, Canada, Australia, the United Arab Emirates, and South Korea have signed up. China is also spearheading a base on the moon with an equally practical title. The International Lunar Research Station, announced in 2021, currently has Russia, Belarus, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, Venezuela, Egypt, and South Africa as signatories. But whichever coalition builds the first base on the moon, they will all need a reliable power source. Across the world, many companies and space agencies have all come to the same conclusion. The truth is that nuclear is the only option to power a moon base, says Simon Middleberg from the Nuclear Futures Institute at Bangor University in Wales. A day on the moon is not 24 hours as on Earth, but a month, or 29.5 days to be precise. There are effectively two weeks of daylight, followed by two weeks of darkness, with temperatures reaching minus 130 C, minus 202 F. This is why the Apollo missions from 1969 to 1972 all took place during the lunar day and close to the moon's equator when temperatures were manageable and prolonged sunlight could power scientific instruments and landers. At the moon's south pole, where any base is most likely to be located, certain locations are illuminated by sunlight more than 80% of the time. But temperatures can drop even further in permanently shadowed craters where frozen water is likely to be found. This water will be needed not just to help keep astronauts alive, but also to produce fuel since there is no gas or oil on the moon. Nuclear is the only game in town, says Middleburg. We can't take fuel up there. Solar panels won't work. Diesel generators won't work and the old-style radiothermal generators just aren't big enough to pack a punch. A micronuclear reactor will have to be light and robust enough to travel 384,400 kilometers, 238,000 miles. A radioisotope thermal generator was first used on the moon in 1969 on Apollo 11 using heat generated by the decay of radioactive plutonium-238 to keep scientific instruments at a working temperature. On Apollo 12, this heat was converted into electricity to power an instrument package, marking the first use of a nuclear reactor on the moon, albeit not on the scale we have on Earth. The cylindrical generator measured just 45.7 by 40.6 centimeters 18.2 by 16.2 in. It's a challenging brief. A micronuclear reactor will have to be light and robust enough to travel 384,400 kilometers, 238,000 miles, and then be installed for use under extremely difficult conditions, including the intrusive fine dust or regolith that covers the lunar surface. In 2022, NASA awarded contracts to Lockheed Martin, Westinghouse and X, a collaboration between Intuitive Machines and X-Energy.
Intuitive Machines recently became the first commercial company to perform the first U.S. soft landing on the moon in over 50 years. The first phase was completed in February 2024 with the submission of designs for a reactor that could sustain a habitable moon base for at least a decade. We have confidence because we have used nuclear technology on prior space missions like Pioneer, Voyager, and Cassini, where the systems far exceeded their original design life, says Shadowbukta, Lunar Architecture Team Lead at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The harsh environments, the desire to minimize mass and volume, provide high reliability and assure uninterrupted power to keep the crew safe are some of the things factored into a reactor design for the lunar surface, says Bakta. Additionally, because of the long distance from Earth and associated communication delays, the system must be designed to perform autonomously on its own. We've got a pretty good idea of what these systems are going to look like and, crucially for space, how much they're going to weigh, Jake Thompson. The Russian space agency, Roscosmos, announced that it will build a lunar nuclear reactor with the China National Space Administration by 2035 to power a joint moon base. Yuri Borisov, Roscosmos Director General, told Russia's state media that it would be constructed without the presence of humans. In March, the UK Space Agency also announced new funding of £2.9 million. 3.6 million dollars for the demonstration of a lunar modular nuclear reactor. After an initial study in 2022, the collaboration between UK industry and academics is being led by Rolls-Royce, a name more commonly associated perhaps with jet engines or luxury cars. For more than 60 years, Rolls-Royce has quietly been designing, manufacturing, and supporting all of the nuclear reactors for the Royal Navy submarines, says Jake Thompson, Rolls-Royce's chief engineer of the company's novel nuclear program. We have a vast heritage of providing very small, very compact nuclear reactors. So we're bringing that capability into these really exciting new domains like space exploration. The Rolls-Royce micro-reactor program is currently in the concept development phase. Testing is being done on prototype components, and the aim is to have a demonstration model ready for lunar delivery by 2029. These are fission-based reactor systems, so they will use a form of low-enriched uranium, says Thompson. We've got a pretty good idea of what these systems are going to look like and, crucially for space, how much they're going to weigh. Each Rolls-Royce micro-reactor will produce 50 to 100 kilowatts and last for at least a decade. It's entirely scalable. It depends on the needs of the architecture and the infrastructure that's on the lunar surface. But we envisage a microgrid with a few of these reactors supplemented with solar power at the South Pole. We're designing the most robust nuclear fuel possible, Simon Middleburg. The micro-reactor will be roughly about the size of a small family car and a few tons in weight. For a nuclear reactor, it's absolutely tiny, says Thompson. For a space system, they're still relatively large. Miniaturization is something many organizations see as key for a successful design, including the Nuclear Futures Institute, which is collaborating on the Rolls-Royce project. We're designing the most robust nuclear fuel possible, and it's based on something that we've been looking at for a few years in the UK called the TRISO. TRI structural isotropic particle, says Middleburg. It's a gobstopper, he says, referring to the spherical, long-lasting, hard-boiled sweet or candy made from multiple layers. It's a sort of fuel where you wrap your uranium in safety barriers and it's extremely robust. It lasts, it could survive, thousands of degrees, and it's the size of a poppy seed. These safety layers include carbon graphite and silicon carbide. Middleburg says graphite is radiation tolerant at high temperatures, 
And it's the sort of thing we use for leading edges on spacecraft, but we're putting this inside a reactor. It's a lovely material, but it's not the final material. I think we can do better. That's what we're working on with people around the world. There are challenges in developing the systems, testing them here on Earth, and operating them at the moon, Shuttle Bukta. There's no doubting the excitement that these lunar micro-reactors are producing within the space industry. But nuclear power on Earth, despite offering an alternative to limited and polluting fossil fuels, is often associated with the atomic bombs, risks from radiation leaks or accidents, such as at Chernobyl in Ukraine or Fukushima in Japan. There are challenges in developing the systems, testing them here on Earth, and operating them at the moon, says NASA's Bakta. The environments, both natural and induced, such as launch vibrations, landing loads, extreme temperatures, lighting, and dust, are a few major ones that are considered. We need lunar power systems that have low mass, high reliability, and fault tolerance that can cope with these environments while providing a service life of many years. Thompson is also prepared to address what could be the worst case scenario. What would happen if there's radioactive material on board a spacecraft and there's an explosion in the Earth's atmosphere shortly after launch? These are the engineering challenges that we work through every day, he says. We would only deploy a system when that system is safe in every aspect of its life cycle, including launch and the reactor, is only designed to be turned on when it actually gets to the lunar surface. Before the reactor is turned on, the nuclear fuel inside is inert. It's perfectly safe to handle and touch, and it's not radioactive until that reactor has been turned on. As part of the design process, engineers are also considering end-of-life procedures for these micro-reactors. When our lunar reactor mission is complete, we will shut it down and the radiation levels will gradually diminish so it can be safely approached and moved to a long-term storage location if desired, says Bakta. Funding and time to mature these technologies are essential, but the benefits of lunar micro-reactor designs could extend to Earth ranging from flexible scalable power modules much smaller than existing power plants to nuclear medicine. We've had lots of nuclear renaissances, but it takes opportunities for us to show that nuclear is safe and zero carbon at the point of delivery, says Middleburg, who is highly optimistic about the technology in space and on Earth. The knock-on applications are incredible if we can show the public that nuclear can be delivered on time, on budget, and do exciting, useful things, things that are going to save the world.